I have three online classes this semester. I usually teach between one to three online classes <clears throat> uh, each semester. So while I know a lot of people were focusing in on doing things that they could bring into their physical classrooms, I was more concerned about what I could do to make my online classrooms a little bit more interactive or welcoming or um, to try to mirror something that I would do more inside a, a physical classroom. <coughs> so my concentration was on videos. Um, and I made uh, three videos specifically. Uh, first one that I did is um, a, a welcome video, which are pretty standard for online classes because I also do um, QM uh, training, or not QM training, but uh, QM course reviews. And this is a component that you see in a great deal of classes, like right now I'm in the middle of one for Rutgers for a uh, um, online information technology class. Um, and while there's always all kinds of different platforms, some of which have video integrated into their learning management system, uh, I chose to do kind of like a straight up, I have a camera, I'm talking to the camera, and what I did <coughs> was basically kind of like a five things for online students to keep in mind as they go through the semester. So, so I shot that. And, you know, just playing around, I had like a script that I was trying to work off of that was like down here below me where the, the tripod was so that I could kind of keep track of what I wanted to say. <clears throat> but the biggest problem that I had with this is the post-production aspect of it. So what I tried to do was to use, because I, I wasn't using my tablet, um, so I tried to take the raw footage and put it into um, Windows Media Player in order to edit it there. And I found that overall to not work very well. So what I then used was um, Lightroom. I'm not gonna do like a demo of Lightroom or anything, but <clears throat> Lightroom is primarily used for photography. And what I really liked about using Lightroom for editing purposes, even though it's mostly for photography, you can do editing in, um, in Lightroom for video, is that it's really good about light adjustment, because I was doing my video in a room that was relatively dark, <coughs> and you could adjust light half stops up and half stops, stops down. So the video quality of what I was shooting, because I was using a camera that had HD capability, the output from it was far better um, than what I got from using Windows tools. So um, what I want to try to work on now after doing this is learning more about Lightroom and other editing techniques and tools that they have. I was watching a lot of YouTube videos trying to say like, okay, well how do I do this and how do I do this? <clears throat> I used to know how to do Adobe Premiere. And that's really what I'd like to start getting back to. Because what I want to do eventually with the videos in my class is to get them to the quality that I'm comfortable enough with them that I can make them kind of legacy parts of my class and not have to be adjusting them every single semester. I realize that'll change. Like whenever we update things, especially with like the online databases here, um, when we <coughs> change it, like for example, recently for at least English studies and literature studies, uh, we used to always have the Literature Resource Center. Now it was always directing students to the Literature Resource Center, and now that has changed to Artemis. Um, so when I went through uh, inside Blackboard, because one of the other videos that I did was, well, one of them, one of them also was for the smart thinking, because that's something that I really try to push students towards using, especially the online students that don't necessarily have the time or capacity to come in for tutoring. Um, I, I remember you know, way back when, when Rhonda was first bringing this, this in to, to Blackboard, what uh, an amazing resource it was, but the problem was trying to actually get students to use it. Um, and even when I would show my brick and mortar students about smart thinking, 
they weren't necessarily going to it. And the ones that would go to it would just be like, oh my gosh, this was so great. And I'm just like, oh, maybe I should video them, like, you know, testimonials. Please go and use Spark Thinking. Um, so, <clears throat> so I tried to use this video, this, this second video, as a way of getting students over to it. The only problem with it is instructor interface and student interface are two very different things with Smart Thinking, so I can't actually show students what the login screen looks like unless I was to get a hold of a student and have them log into their account because instructors aren't able to log in to Smart Thinking. Um, so that might be something else I would like to do later on if I could, you know, kind of corral a student and say, hey, can I use your account for a minute or two so that you can see, I can videotape uh, or use. The biggest thing, the greatest thing out of ITPD3, at least for me personally, is Screencast-O-Matic, um, which <clears throat> is a tool that not only am I using for trying to capture content for my videos, but now my students, I'm having them use this or a combination of things because one of the requirements that one of the classes that I teach now, not actually here but at another place, is that students, all students in the class have to do a presentation. And initially that was kind of like, oh no, because I don't have the time, the classroom time, to have them all do five to ten minute presentations because it would eat up too much class time. So they're all going to have to use either Screencast-O-Matic, Prezi, um, PowerPoint with voice capture, or they can do video editing. Okay, depending on their skill level. And what's great about Screencast-O-Matic is it's so intuitive and easy to use and gives such great results um, that it's kind of like anybody can use it. You know, you and you, and you can use it. Um, so screencast and mag I would definitely recommend, you know, if you don't have an account or if you haven't gone in and played with it, play with it. It's essentially the same kind of thing which you would get with like a Jing or something like that where you're capturing the screen, you're able to talk, you're using your, your, your um, mouse, you're going through whatever screens that you need to go through in order to show your audience what you want to show them. So for two of the three of the videos that I did, I used uh, Screencast-O-Matic. It's available inside Blackboard that's meant to help you with uh, getting help outside of class. And not just in this class, but in a variety of different classes here at Prince George's Community College. Another thing that I experienced by going through ITPD3 and, and learning about video interface is closed captioning <laughs> of video. Um, and I gotta say thank you so much to Ed. He did such a great job with, with getting back to me because the first time I did it, it didn't quite work correctly. But um, while using videos inside class is great, and you'll, you'll also see when, when you're moving the mouse, the mouse gets this little halo around it so that your students can pick up real quickly about what you're trying to show them with the mouse. So that's another great thing about screencast o -Matic. But um, the most time-consuming aspect of any of the times that you want to put video material up on your course is the closed captioning. Um, there, if you're using a script that you've already generated previously, I'm guessing it would probably be a lot easier to do that. <clears throat> but if you're going back after the fact, after you've already spoken all the things that you want to speak, this takes infinitely longer to do than what uh, the actual capture is. But you have to do it because of um, 508 compliance and making sure that it's available for um, ADA uh, compliance as well. So it's a really, really important part of, of what you're doing with the videos. And any video that you're uploading, even if you're uploading it for your brick and mortar classes, you really need to also be ADA compliant as far as um, legality is concerned. And then I'm talking in lecture and I'm saying, okay, this, 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 and I'm clicking on this and clicking on this, and the students are watching and they're taking notes and watching. Sometimes they need to be able to go back and say, well, what did I actually click on and what is the next thing that I'm going to see on my screen? So. It helps to reinforce the things that you're doing, even in physical lecture. But um, for people that are in online classes, it's it's really important and helpful since they aren't seeing something physical. This is kind of their only shot. And if you're just sitting there in lecture and 
typing or in an online lecture and typing something out or giving screenshots, that's one thing, but to see the process unfold the way it would naturally do it when you're inside the, the browser really helps. Um, and students are telling me that it really helps. So I, I believe them. I mean, the whole point is to give them the resources. <clears throat> so I really want to work on trying to improve these videos in subsequent semesters, thinking about things that I could do other videos for that are going to be helpful for the students. Um, so that's really kind of my goal from now, my next, my next uh, phase of my own, uh, my, uh, my own ITPD4. I've had more online students come to my office hours this semester than I have in any previous semester. Hmm. So I don't know if the videos are making it either like if the class is more approachable or I'm more approachable, but, and I'll, that's something else I'll want to track in future semesters, but that's something that's never happened before. If I get like one coming in, it's like, wow, really? Um, and this semester I've had like five. So I, I definitely think these videos are working. That's why I want to try to work on making them better and doing more with them.